Today's video covers the fourth and final step in the traditional four-step travel demand model, which is referred to as traffic assignment. After today's lecture, students should be able to solve traffic assignment problems to obtain one of two solutions, which are generally referred to as user equilibrium and system optimal solutions. And in addition, they should be able to distinguish between user equilibrium and system optimality and understand when and where those may actually occur within a transportation system. So traffic assignment is the final step in our four-step planning model. So up to this point, we've gone through trip generation. We know how many trips are starting and ending in each of our traffic analysis zones. We've then distributed those trips so we know how many trips are starting and ending from point A to point B, so between each of the travel analysis zones. We've then distributed these trips by mode, so we know of those trips what percent will use transit versus personal automobile. And so our last step ultimately is to determine what routes are going to be utilized between these zones and how much traffic can be expected on each of those routes. Now, in order to make this determination, there are several pieces of information that are required of us. First of all, we need to know the outcome of the preceding three steps. So we need to know how many motor vehicle trips are going to go from one TAZ to another. We also need to know what routes are available between those zones, as well as what the expected travel times would be on those routes. And from that, we need to establish some sort of decision criteria, which is going to guide the process by which users select one route versus another. And so if we think about this big picture, let's assume we have two prospective routes A and B between a given origin and destination. If the travel times between those routes are equal to one another or the ratio of travel times is equal to one, we see that 50% of travelers would choose route A and 50% would choose route B. And as the travel time on route A gets relatively large compared to B, most travelers would tend to shift towards B and vice versa as the travel time on A gets smaller relative to B. So if we look at this context, traffic assignment and route choice behavior essentially present a classic equilibrium problem like you would have encountered in prior math or science courses perhaps. So what we see is that route choice decisions are essentially a function of travel time. As travel time goes up, a route becomes less desirable to travelers. Now this is complicated by the fact that travel times are a function of traffic flow or volume or how many travelers are using that route. And consequently, traffic flow is ultimately a byproduct of these route choice decisions. And so what we see here is it becomes difficult to disentangle the effects here of are people using this route because it has a lower travel time or does it have a lower travel time because of the number of persons that are using that route. Now, to investigate this phenomenon further, what we do is develop a series of regression equations or mathematical models that relate route travel time to traffic flow or traffic volume on those facilities and we refer to these generally as highway performance functions. We'll also see the term referred to as a capacity restraint method. So given that we have certain capacity which is going to restrict flow and increase travel time, what we try to do is ultimately relate those travel times to volumes. And so one of the oldest and most fundamental capacity restraint methods is introduced here which was developed by the Bureau of Public Roads BPR which was the predecessor to the Federal Highway Administration and what this research has shown is that generally at low volumes we see marginal increases in travel time and as we begin to approach capacity conditions we see a much more pronounced increase in travel times in fact this ends up being roughly a fourth order function and as these travel times increase significantly we see that large levels of congestion would then come into play and this would be the point where traffic may begin diverting to alternate routes and so if we're trying to model this traffic assignment or route choice behavior the initial research that was developed in this area was by a researcher named Wardrop and he outlined two principles the first of which is that users are going to select a route such that they're minimizing their own travel time so the only thing they care about in getting from point A to point B is which of the possible routes they can take is going to get them there in the shortest time possible and so if all travelers utilize this same principle we arrive at a situation that's referred to as user equilibrium 
So all users are trying to minimize their own travel times. And in doing so, what we find if everyone is minimizing their travel times, then those travel times would tend to be equal to one another. The second principle of Wardrop is that users can also distribute themselves across the road network such that they're minimizing the average travel time in the system. And if they're average, if they're minimizing the average travel time, they're also minimizing the total system travel time. Now, at first glance, it may appear that this would give the same solution as user equilibrium, but what actually happens under this condition is that users will distribute themselves such that some people would face a higher travel time, some would face a lower travel time, but the overall travel time in the system is minimized, and so we refer to this as a system optimal solution and this process as system optimization. We'll start by going through a brief introduction and demonstration of each of these two solutions. And so first of all, under user equilibrium, we operate under a few general underlying assumptions. And those assumptions are that travelers are going to select their route from one location to another based solely on the travel time between those routes. And now in order to make that determination, travelers would actually have to know the travel time on each route that's available to them in getting from point A to point B. While historically this has been a relatively strong assumption, what we tend to find if we're focusing on higher class facilities, high speed facilities, and long travel distances, we tend to have reasonably good and reliable information from resources such as Google and Waze and the Iowa DOT, for example. And we also have in-vehicle navigation systems that have the capability to provide us with real-time travel time information. And so consequently, what we find is given this information will under user equilibrium travel times between zones will be equal across every route that's used and so what that means ultimately is if a route is not providing the same level of performance to the other routes between those destinations if it has a higher travel time it's simply not going to be utilized and so related to that point, if the travel times on every route are the same, no individual traveler can switch routes and improve their own travel time. So if you divert to another route, you're going to, in the best case scenario, see a slightly higher travel time than you would have seen previously. Now this is probably best demonstrated through a brief example problem. So let's start with a demonstration of user equilibrium to where we examine the travel times on two routes between a specific origin and destination. So we're given that route one has a free flow travel time of six minutes. So if there's no traffic on the facility whatsoever, we could expect to get from point A to point B in six minutes. And that travel time will increase by two minutes for every 500 vehicle increase in hourly volume or flow rate. Conversely, Route 2 with low volumes actually provides a superior free flow travel time of four minutes. However, its travel time is going to increase more rapidly as a function of the square of its volume in thousands of vehicles per hour. So with this information in hand, we are going to assume user equilibrium and determine the following quantities, assuming a total flow rate of 4,500 vehicles per hour from point A to point B. So we want to determine the travel time on each route, the volume that will be utilizing each of those routes, and from those two pieces of information, we can then determine the total system travel time. And so first of all, we'll start with our highway performance functions. And so it was given previously that the free flow travel times were six minutes and four minutes on routes one and two respectively. And we had that the travel time on route one would increase by two minutes for every 500 vehicle increase in terms of hourly volumes. And so that results in a four minute increase in travel time for every thousand vehicles as X1 and X2 are represented in these equations in terms of thousands of vehicles per hour. Travel time on route two would increase as a second order function of that flow on that second route. And so as we begin setting up an analytical solution here, there are three pieces of information that are of relevance to us. The travel time functions for each of these routes as well as the total volume. So we have a basic flow conservation identity as illustrated on the preceding slide. We had a total volume of 4,500 vehicles per hour during that peak hour period. And so we know by consequence that our total flow, which we'll refer to as Q, is simply going to be equal to X1, which is the flow on the first route, plus X2, which is the flow on the second route, with all these quantities being denoted in terms of thousands of vehicles per hour. 
So the first thing we do under a user equilibrium problem is we actually check to see whether or not both routes are going to be utilized. If we do not check this and we do not have sufficient volume to guarantee both routes are utilized, we'll see some strange solutions that could include negative volumes, for example. So you need to be careful of this. So first of all, if we assume all the traffic is assigned to Route 1, so we put all 4,500 vehicles on Route 1, we find a 25-minute travel time. Under that situation, people could obviously switch to Route 2 and improve their travel times, which is an indication that Route 2 should be utilized. Similarly, if we assigned all the traffic to Route 2, that would result in a 24.25-minute travel time, and those travelers could easily switch to Route 1 then to improve that time. And so from this, we can conclude that both routes will ultimately be utilized. So from this, we start with Wardrip's user equilibrium principle, which tells us that if all routes are being utilized, their travel times will be equal to one another, which means that T1 is equal to T2. And so plugging in those respective equations, we have 6 plus 4 times x1 is equal to 4 plus x2 squared. We also know from conservation of flow that x1 plus x2 is equal to 4.5. And so we can simply plug in 4.5 minus x2 for x1 in this equation. And then solving for x2, we find that we would expect 2,899 vehicles on Route 2 and 1,601 vehicles on Route 1. Just converting that from thousands of vehicles per hour in to the actual hourly equivalents right here. From those volumes, we can then calculate the travel times, just plugging in 1601 and 2899. And we find, as you should expect under user equilibrium, those travel times on the routes will be equal to one another at 12.4 minutes. From here, we can then calculate the total system travel time. And so system travel time can be calculated just by taking the number of vehicles that are using Route 1 times the Route 1 travel time plus the number of vehicles that are using Route 2 plus the Route 2 travel time. And so in looking at this equation, we find we have 28 199 vehicles on Route 1, we have 1,601 on Route 2, and those vehicles in some total have 55,800 vehicle minutes of travel time, and converting that to hours, we find 930 vehicle hours under user equilibrium. In contrast to user equilibrium, under system optimal solutions, we find that there will likely be a single route strategy that will minimize the total travel time across our system, but that's not necessarily going to correspond to our user equilibrium case. And so stated mathematically, we can return to our total system travel time function that was presented on the previous slide. So we have a number of different routes, each with their own unique volumes and travel times, and if we simply take that function and minimize that, that will then deliver us a system optimal solution and so we'll know the volumes and travel times on each of those respective routes. And so we'll return to the prior example problem and calculate those exact same quantities, so the travel time, the traffic volumes, and the total system-wide travel time. So previously we had determined what the performance functions were for each of these roadways. And so the system travel time is simply equal to the volume times the respected travel time functions. And so just expanding this expression, we end up with the quantity that we see right here. So we have one equation and two unknowns. And so the question then is how do we solve for x1 and or x2? And we return once again to our conservation of flow. And since we know that x1 plus x2 is equal to 4,500 vehicles per hour, we can simply sub in for x1 the same 4.5 minus x2 quantity. And we'll then end up with this equation that you see demonstrated right here. And so this is an equation for our total system travel time as a function of the volume on the second route. And so if we want to solve this equation, we're trying to minimize this. And so naturally, we simply take the first derivative of this equation and then set it equal to zero. And so in doing so, we then solve for x2 and find that it's equal to 2.467, which should look slightly different from the solution we saw previously to user equilibrium. And so under this setting, we see 2,467 vehicles on Route 2 and 2,033 vehicles on Route 1. And instead of our 12.4 minute travel times, we now see that Route 1 
has drivers seeing a 14.13 minute travel time on average, while travelers on Route 2 are seeing a 10.08 minute average travel time. And of course, these are not equal to the user equilibrium travel times because what's happening here is Route 2, we had noticed previously that the volumes here increase as a second order function. And so what that means is as you start getting closer to capacity conditions, we're going to see very rapid changes in travel times. In contrast, these increases in travel times are much more gradual over that same range on Route 1. And so what happens in effect is that travelers on Route 1 are essentially paying a penalty by accepting a larger travel time that's going to minimize the total travel time across the entire system. And so in looking at this, we find that under the system optimal solution, plugging in those respected flow rates and travel times, we end up with a total delay of 893.2 vehicle hours. And so in comparison to user equilibrium, this results in a rather substantial savings of 36.8 vehicle hours. And this is total across those 4,500 travelers during that one hour analysis period. And so ultimately from this process, whether it's user equilibrium or system optimal, we would end up at the end of the day with a relatively good estimate of how much traffic is using our network, what the travel times are on those networks, and then what level of delay travelers would face. And so ultimately this wraps up the four step travel demand process. So we had started with the trip generation step wherein we obtained information about each of these traffic analysis zones, how many households live there, what the employment levels were. And from that we could determine how many trips would be produced in or attracted to each of those zones. Under trip distribution, we took that information in combination with travel time information to distribute these trips between each each of the zonal pairs. Having made that determination and obtained information about the modal alternatives that can get you between each of these pairs of zones, we then distributed those trips between the available modes. And having determined among those modes how many are using automobile, we then identified the route alternatives from one zone to another and assign traffic to each of those respective routes. And so consequently, this provides a wrap up to our four-step travel demand model process.